I'm Mark Akiris, and I was Nicholas Cage's standing for 10 years, 1994 through 2004. My job as a stand-in was to match Nick Cage's look, his height, and sometimes his mannerisms while I stood under a light acting like a mannequin as the crew set up the shot. Hello, Richard Santoro. Ah, I'm Ricky! Ah, oh, I'm Ricky! I'm a little tired, I'm a little wired, so cut me some friggin' slack! Yeah! I'd like to take his, his face. Whoa. Once the crew was ready to roll, I stepped out, and Nick stepped in. My buddy Marco Kiris is here. He was uh, Nicholas Cage's stand-in for how long? How many years did you do that? Uh, ten years. Ten years as a stand-in. Ten years. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. You've never been asked this before, and I know you haven't seen the movie, but this is something that's been bugging me about once upon a time in Hollywood since the first time I saw it. And I went back three more times to make sure I saw this properly. I think you and I talked about this already, but there are scenes in the movie where they keep doing close-ups of Brad Pitt's shoes. He's the stand-in, and he's wearing flat moccasins, no sole, no heel. And they do close-ups of Leonardo DiCaprio, who's the TV star that he's the stand-in for, and he's always wearing cowboy boots with five-inch heels. <laughs> and they kept doing it. If they'd done it once, I would have gone, okay. But uh, Tarantino did it about four more times. And the reason I think he was doing it, and you'll be able to answer this, is because I think he was dissing the ego of actors. You know, he's always had issues with actors. And I think he was dissing their ego by saying, hey, the stand-in has to wear flats so that he's never taller than the movie star when they're out together. And that's what I got out of that. And it bugged me so much that I went to uh, Quentin Tarantino's Twitter page and I asked the question and I never got an answer. But what do you think of that? Because you must know other stand-ins. I'm not talking yeah. particularly about Cage, because you and yeah. him are roughly the same size, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, here's my take on it, and not having seen the film. I think that they did that because um, many times the actors may be shorter than the stunt guard the, or the stand-in, so they're photographing him in those heels, meaning the star, who's supposed to be the star in it, to show that um, he has to wear these lifts in these big boots to to be equal because you can't cut these stand-ins uh, feet off, so he's gotta be in flats. Right. So it was the opposite for me because Cage is about two inches taller than I am, so I actually had to wear lifts in my boots and shoes um, all the time. So if you photograph the two of us, I'm the guy in the high heels to match up to yeah. his height because he's really strong. Okay, so tall. using that argument, Tom Cruise's stand-in is probably eight years old. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he probably is. That would be my guess. I mean, where would they get a guy? I don't know how they get a guy. I saw him once. Yeah. And I swear to God, he's no more than 5'6". Yeah, yeah. I, yeah I've, met, I've met him a couple of times, but I think he was wearing uh, bigger shoes. It was, was like looking at a little boy with pecs, which I would <laughs> never do. But it was like, and I'll never have to, because it was like looking at a little boy built like a brick. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. My jaw dropped a mile. I think I'm kind of jaded. I'm kind of used to it, though, Mike, because I've seen all these people, and I've, I've seen Tom Cruise uh, and, and, and a bunch of other actors who are shorter, and they do wear bigger shoes. And so it depends on, on who they're dating at the time. Yeah. But Cage was already big, so the opposite occurred. I had to wear lifts all the time, and I think that Tarantino was probably doing it to show that the standard, just because their likeliness on the face was, 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 uh, was what they wanted, but the height difference was huge, and so they had the actor with lifts, and the stand-in would have to be in flat shoes okay um, what about your uh, thick lustrous greek hair did that ever pose a problem with <laughs> with the uh, cage it did i mean because he's much, had uh, he's had uh work done he's had hair transplants he's had some work done from what i understand um but uh, no marco he's yeah. had hair transplants <laughs> yeah he's had some stuff i believe he's had it some looked stuff like done. i saw yeah. i had him on my show it looked like yeah. a topographical map of a cornfield after <laughs> harvest the top of his head. I could see where every single seedling was popped into his skull. Yeah, I think it's. I think he's kind of over that stuff now. As you know, he's in his mid fifties, so I don't think he's overly conscious about that part of life. But it did pose a big problem because the, the relight him when he showed up, and we had to like change the uh, the the filters and the screens and so forth each time. So it was. It did pose a problem, but I was really good at what I did but they had to like readjust the minute he got on the set. Now the, the how, how, well, you were never in show business before you got that job. 
Uh, I was. I was kind of like floating around trying to be an actor, but I was a real lousy actor. Um, yeah. like I was never, so what were you doing for a living then? I was working as a waiter. All right. So you were doing, that's typical. You yeah. were doing the waiter thing, yeah. taking acting. Yeah. The going out stuff. for auditions. Yeah. Lousy. Right. Yeah, Terrible. You do, you do look like them. I, I do at times. I'm not sure about today, but I do at times. It just depends on, on, on the moment, depends on hair, makeup, wardrobe, depends on the attitude. Well, the bottom line is you have the same shape head yeah. and roughly the same physique, right? And height. Pretty close. Yeah, pretty close. Yeah. Pretty close. So how, how, how did you even, I know you didn't, somebody must have approached you and said, hey, you should uh, be a stand-in for Nicolas Cage. It happened a few times, but the, the truth is, Mike, I was uh, working at, uh, at a restaurant in Toronto after I'd already been in L.A. and living there for years on end, and I kind of gave up on everything. You I was struggling there. I was a typical struggling actor. I was broke, bankrupt. I had no money. I was your typical guy coming back at the age of 30, and I ended up in a little basement apartment in Greektown back here at home. And uh, I, I got a job as a waiter, and then I signed up with an extras agency uh, just yeah. to make a little bit of extra money. And uh, and then which they, they call background actors now they call them background yeah, actors yeah now it's a little more formal back then it was like extras and I'd never done stand in work before so this agency said oh there's a there's a gig to be a Nick Cage stand in but it's in Niagara on the lake and we'd like you to go and at this point I'd even own a car I was on the bus in the subway what was the movie what movie it was uh, Trapped in Paradise yeah I remember that yeah. with uh, Dana Carvey oh fuck it was terrible <laughs> it was terrible it was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was terrible to work on that thing it was like minus 117 <laughs> so I didn't want to do the job I got the job. The first That's not even he, when the when the uh, downhill uh, trip started, though, because he did a couple of good ones after that. But yeah. Trapped in Paradise was probably the first really bad one he did, right? Yeah, I think so because he was he was on a good roll with with films. Uh, well, he was he did worse films after I was gone. Yeah, but he. This well, was let's a, talk about this first one though. Because, yeah, yeah. Uh, how'd, you, how'd, you, how'd you get that? Well, it was I I went for this audition and uh, they had to bring in another standing guy. I was going for the audition to drive me to Niagara on the Lake to go for the audition after my waiter shift. And uh, I was working at Bistro 990, which doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. But um, so we went there in the first AD, thought that I was perfect. You know, his liking this height at the time he had this Is it the first AD, the assistant director who the makes that first decision? AD, he made that decision, yeah. They usually do. It's usually the first AD or the second AD who make that decision. Of course, yeah. I'd never done it before, and they asked me a bunch of questions, and I said, I don't really know, but I was, a, you know, I was an actor member, and that's what, you had to be an actor member. But the other two guys were experienced that they hired on the spot as well, and they said, well, they're going to teach you the ropes. Don't talk to the actor. Just kind of follow up, do what he does. Don't talk to the actor. Well, don't they're you to that. They're, they're big on, don't talk to They them. want you to be the don't guy, say anything. but just, they don't just, want you to just, meet just, the guy? Be, don't talk, don't speak, don't speak. It's one of those things, because we're subservient to these people. Yeah. And so I followed orders to a certain degree once I got the job, but then I became myself as I am now, and I kind of took over because I realized, you know, these film sets are kind of rogue. They're not as organized as people think they are. Yeah. I found it to be a little chaotic. And uh, and I just kind of like put my, my maitre d' skills and waiter skills intact, and I kind of like, took over and then i kind of took over like you started you befriended everybody and networked and all that yeah jazz. i did all that stuff and networked and things and then i kind of so, like so told behind them, the phoniness of hollywood well, yeah there's well, the phoniness of the stand-in <laughs> life well because i'd already lived in hollywood um mike for years and so i was a little a little boisterous a little louder than most people these yeah. can, the canuckers are a little more timid a little shy they're afraid of losing their job i was like fuck this sucks it's minus 17 outside i'm fucking i've got pneumonia like i think i should be back and be away but i saw that it was disorganized and i would tell cage where the marks were because nobody else was telling him where the marks well, you were told are. not to talk to him but you told him that but i did but i'd say i basically broke the rules and i didn't really care because i thought well if they fire me i get to go back home what what, what does it matter how much was it paying then i was actually making a decent weekly salary with overtime it was about fifteen hundred dollars a week uh so we're talking time. like 25 years ago yeah, 25 years ago. Exactly. That was pretty good money. Years. It was pretty good money. And then it got really crazy after that. But right. uh, but I did my own thing and I kind of like took charge of what I thought was the right thing to do to tell the actor because people were not really communicating and it would create a lot of chaos and people were- At that point, had you met him or you just walked up and started telling him where to stand? No, I didn't meet him at all. I just kind of told him where to stand and where this is and where the marks are and these are the cameras. Okay, and so the you know angle. what? And he Somebody... said, thank you. He was really polite. And he said, oh, thank you. He was amazed that I was aware of what I was doing. Right. But I have an innate curiosity when somebody walks up to me out of the blue and says something to me, you know, or gives me instructions that are going to benefit me. My first response would be, oh, hi, my name's uh, Mike. What's yours? And uh, I would have a conversation with the person. 
And I don't understand why he would just say, okay, thanks, that's uh, great. I know where to stand now. I think the truth is... He knows you're standing in for him, right? Yeah, 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 he does. But I also think that he's, you know, been through the mill. He's already done, you know, a zillion films by now. And uh, I think I was 30 or 31. He was two years younger than I. But he was, you know, he's groomed to be a superstar. But he's already been on films where most standards are really schlocky. They're kind of like wacky for the most part. And uh, a lot of these guys are just, you know, they're off well, the wall. Plus, he comes from Hollywood royalty. I mean, right. everybody knows his real name is Nicholas Coppola. He's uh, yes. Francis Coppola's nephew, right? Yeah, and I knew that having lived and gone to you know acting classes and lived yeah. in L.A. I was a little on the jaded side. But he didn't say anything, and I was fine with him not saying anything because I understood that he's also protecting himself. Secondly, we were working nights. It was, you know, minus 20, 30 degrees. It was Yeah, a lot winter. of that movie was filmed outside. Most of it was filmed outside, yeah. and it was miserable. So everybody wanted to get to their marks, shoot the shot, and go back. Right. And so there was minimal conversation on that set, and people were kind of bewildered with where things were going. And that's why I think that he wasn't really talking to me. But within a month, the guy warmed up, opened up, introduced himself, and brought me to the trailer. And within a the, month. Within a month. I like the way you're saying that. Like, what a great thing. Within a month. But <laughs> but in Hollywood terms, it is. Four weeks after I said hello. <laughs> But it wasn't about, because standards come and go. So you could have six different standards working for him on one set. What if I sucked after two weeks? He'd so he didn't say, have one regular guy at that point. No. And many times there are a lot of standards who are on a show who get fired after a week or two weeks. And so you've got like four or five different what's, guys. What's a good reason to fire a standard? Uh, d- doing what I did. <laughs> overstepping the boundaries. Yeah, overstepping you know, the line. Talking to the actor, telling him what to do. The yeah. camera guys aren't, but I am. The DP's not, but I am. The director's not, but I am. So it's like, who the fuck's this guy? And, yeah. and I, it's really, but I was already a Hollywood kind of guy. So they kind of allowed me to play this. And the director was a real Hollywood duty kind of guy. Even though he was a New Yorker, he was this boisterous big Who was guy. He? Who George was he? Gallo. Big guy. Is he big still like directing? You. Still directing. Directs a lot, actually. Yeah. And he's a writer. And um, he did Midnight Run. He directed okay, Midnight I, Run yeah, as well. Big Probably film. the only good comedy De Niro ever did. Yeah, it was a great, great film. But uh, so then they gave him this as a directorial debut. So he wasn't really sure of himself in terms of a director right. or marks or camera lenses. He's a writer. And those guys count on that first AD and that second they AD, do. right? And the cinematographer. And yeah. then I realized that this guy wasn't as on par as a director should be. So I kind of took over the technical verbal side of things. And it actually worked out not knowing that it would lead to a 10 year career. What Nick needed and wanted was somebody who was in tune to what was going on on set and right. i was that guy i was like well aware of it he so was part well of the aware. job communicating back to him what's really going on well it became part of the job yeah. uh i mean it should happen from other people but it was happening from me all right so uh you do this movie with him yeah. after about a month yeah <laughs> you become acquaintances yeah because that's a that's the only word i can think of here yeah. not friends after a month you become acquaintances who that's exchange great. pleasantries yes and at some point he's obviously developed uh, a relationship with you and decides that he wants you to be his only guy going forward right yes and uh and his hair and makeup guys who are part of his regular team by who must that. have nervous breakdowns on a regular basis because they see different guys come and go <laughs> all the time but and they're new yorkers uh, yeah. at the time and and they also you know told cage that i was like the right guy and so forth and so forth so they were into me because i was i would also tell them what the shots were nobody would go to hair and makeup and tell them what the shots were i would tell them it's a medium shot it's a head shot it's a wide shot you don't have to worry about this he's wearing a hat yeah, did you learn all that in the course of a month less than a month and but i was very loud like proving like, once and for all that movie makers not rockets <laughs> yes and it's like a a, a malfunction factory right. it, it really doesn't operate well if, if you don't have the the key the, the head guy the director along with the producers on par and it seemed to be that cage was more on par along with the cinematographer who was uh, jack green who was clint eastwood cinematographer yeah and uh, and they brought him on because he knew how to control a set and control the shots and the lighting so yeah because a good director there. will have a good cinematographer and he'll right. let the cinematographer go when it comes to shooting yes right and that's what was happening so it was a well shot picture it just wasn't a good picture Right. overall but right. cinematically it looked good the lighting was great because that's all the cinematographer so cares about he doesn't care about content yeah. <laughs> he doesn't care about performance yeah no i saw an interview with uh geez i can't remember who it was but it was the guy who did uh a lot of john wayne movies mm. and he said he couldn't care less about performance couldn't care less about the set his only concern was getting the shots and he that was monument valley mm-hmm. and i think it got nominated for best cinematography i think it might have won the searchers 
And uh, the cinematography was unbelievable. And it's amazing how mind-blowing that portion of a film can be. Mm -hmm. It's like the music, picking the music. People don't think, oh, people don't think the soundtrack's a big deal. Mm -hmm. But the music and the cinematography can make or break a movie, I think. Yeah, I, I think so too. I saw some documentary just recently about that. And, uh, and, and these guys are instrumental to putting things together. And they really work well with, you know, with, with the footage that they have. And yeah. I think cinematographers are very much in their own headspace. They have to make it look great. So if there's any, anything lacking in direction, they're going to make up for in lighting. And at the same time, the actors are well aware of it. And people, veterans like Cage, remember he was the only real film actor. Dana Carvey was a, was an SNL guy along with John Lovitz, who are the co-stars. Yeah. So they were more TV guys and stuff. Cage was a film person. He was well aware of a film set, but he also knows not to befriend everybody because everybody kind of flakes out because the next day could be sick with the flu and you're gone. Oh, whatever happened to that guy? Oh, he's sick. He he quit. Uh, he was. Uh, we couldn't get him again. That happens all the time. People drop out. So, so not a lot of, you don't get a lot of lifelong friendships out of a movie set. Oh my God, no. You that know, stuff we read in the paper and stuff must be bullshit when people, oh, the chemistry between them was unbelievable and da 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 da, da. And then they, they may not see each other again after. That's correct. But the chemistry, is, it's not bullshit. It is pretty good. It depends on the film. But after that, you may not see them for 10 years because you're, you're in different places and you're working in different countries and different films. A lot of people don't correspond right. after that. They're just too busy. Yeah. It's just, you know, you're on set 14 hours a day, everybody's busy. And everybody assumes that you're not going to be there the next day, especially in these elements. It's like if you have such a low-lying position like my position was, it's like, why would I go there and, and subject myself to the cold when I can get another job? I mean, this was just a job, you know, for, for the moment. Okay, how did he uh, how did he approach you and tell you he wanted you to be his guy? Well, his assistant came up to me and uh, and asked me to go into the trailer. When you say lunch. assistant, do you mean just on the set or assistant that's with them all the time? This is his, his traveling assistant. Traveling. The traveling assistant. Is there a non-traveling assistant? There are, and they're local people. <laughs> but the traveling assistant was based out of L.A. What, what the hell does a traveling assistant do? Do they carry their, carry their shit? <laughs> I, know they, I think they carry their other shit. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they, they, they travel with them. They've got their itineraries together. As a rising actor, uh, Mike, these people have to have certain people with them. Hair, makeup. We didn't have a wardrobe yeah. person, but he had this assistant. But you he know, whenever, the driver. Marco, whenever I hear assistant, I think of David Spade's assistant assistant who uh -huh. couldn't take it anymore apparently he was so abusive and you know david spade's another tom cruise right he's like i don't know he's five four ninety yeah. pounds and the the, the assistant <laughs> kicked the shit out of him one night at the house and david spade had to taser him and call the cops no oh it was a big story when it happened it was about 20 years ago and uh david spade had the taser guy and i remember when i was doing a tv show and stuff i went wow i i don't understand these people who a have assistance period but pick a guy who they didn't give a psychological test to, who's in your house all the time, and you don't know what the hell his breaking point is. You know, yeah. that, that stuff strikes me as really, really weird. I think things happen, though. I, I think circumstances happen, and then, you know, flares. People flare up, they get all kind of crazy. You know, Everybody what, hates their boss at some yeah. point. Well, at some point. These guys were friends as well, yeah. though. They were friends yeah. for many, many years and so forth. And so this guy was became a producer later on. Um, but uh, a lot of those assistants do become associate producers or work in production to a, to a larger capacity. Uh, so this was his buddy that they bring. And a lot of actors do travel with their assistants if they have the um, the clout to have a studio pay for it. Right. Yeah. Because I also, I'll tell you, another person you talk to when you want to know what's going on with movie stars and TV stars, limo drivers. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're in a limo and you're going somewhere and you, and, and you do it right and start asking the guy questions yeah. about people who've been in the car, you find out all kinds of stuff. And uh, uh, this guy drove during TIFF. And he told me that trying to get a tip out of a movie star is just unbelievable because all they say to you is, oh, the studio's picking this up, right? And then they get out of the car. And even though it hasn't cost them a dime, they don't even tip. I think movie stars and uh, so other celebrities believe that 20% of nothing is nothing. <laughs> There's a 20% because I didn't pay anything for this ride, which yeah. just blows my mind. Like you're getting all this free shit. Yeah. And you're not even tipping out on it. I don't think they have that mindset though, Mike. I mean, I was a waiter for a hundred years and, 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 and drivers and so forth, kind of expect a tip, limo drivers, but their headspace, I don't think is actually there. First of all, they carry no cash on them to start right. with. Which the is, a, which is an assumption cash. that somebody else is going to pay your way. 
Yeah, which is which is kind of like par for the course. So when you get these itineraries, there's no there's no itinerary saying make sure everybody gets tipped along the way. They have an assistant who comes in and does certain things, but the actors carry nothing but maybe a driver's license and and maybe a cell phone at the time. Usually it's the assistants who carry that. Right. They've just got nothing on them and they're just like bare bones expecting the publicist and the assistant to kind of take care of everything. Yeah. For example, at TIFF or at Can or wherever they're at. Or hiring a stand in. Yeah, or I understand it. So this guy approaches you on the set. Yeah. And uh, what do he say to you? He says, you know, we'd like to have a little conversation with you in Nick's trailer during lunchtime. And lunchtime, working nights, means midnight. Yeah. And, did, you uh, think, did you think he was going to grope you? Oh, I thought he was going to fire me. <laughs> okay, because my first thought, lunch in Nick's trailer right away. I would, uh. hop, I would hop right to the... Uh, Casting couch deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially if it's a if if you're a stand-in who looks like a movie star, because there's nothing a movie star wants more than to fuck him or herself. So <laughs> right away I'd be going, okay, well, maybe you know that's what? Why I'm not going Lisa in Marie Presley. Yeah, yeah. They did look alike. They had the same mouth. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I never thought that because I thought because I was overstepping my boundary. I thought the ads are going to fire me, the director's going to fire me, or it's the big guy himself. So I thought maybe he's just going to like let me go because I've been kind of mouthy, you know, yeah. in terms of what we should do. But he actually complimented me for everything that I'd done, and then asked me. So he knew what you'd been doing. Yeah, nobody even when had he done wasn't it on before. the set. Exactly. And what he wanted was that. And I didn't realize that that's what he wanted. I was just doing this for a job because I didn't think of traveling after that. I was going to get another job after this. Right. Uh, but that became the beginning of, you know, we'd like you to, to go on the next film, providing that the rest of the film goes well. Because what if I fucked up two weeks later? Right. This is only a month into this three month picture. So now you got the added pressure and knowing now I got to do this and yeah. I've got to be perfect for the rest of this shoot. How much time was left on the movie? Two more that? months. Two, two more months, months in the cold. And, and it was tough. I did a lot of photo doubling as well. So they used me for the feet, shoes, coats, wallet, hand stuff. Um, and I watched everything he Yeah, did. people don't know. When they're not doing a speaking scene, they're not there. Right? Not for those small shots. Not no. for those small. Because time is money. So these guys are on a 12-hour turnaround time, uh, you know, yeah. according to Screen Actors Guild. And we can shoot later and then therefore they can do me. So if you need to pick up the glass and you're not seeing anybody, you're just picking it up and putting it down, it would be me doing that because why keep the actor there when you have to bring him in the next day right. under a set time? And right. that makes a lot of sense to me. As long as you're paying attention, you know what he's doing, and you know your hands are rough. You, know, you can't have rough hands. I can't look like a factory worker. My hands are similar to his, though his are better. They're like piano hands. So I, you know, I have to like shave my arms a little bit. He's a little lighter in the hair. <laughs> <laughs> need to put a little makeup on mine too. I'm a, I'm a little on the olive side. So, so did they give you a raise midway through the shoot? Where you gonna no, get more money? No, I got money? nothing. Zero. They just you know I was just so happy it was the same the deal as you had going in to yeah. finish this movie. Yeah. All right. So it's fifteen hundred bucks a week, approximately. And now you got more pressure on you. Lot. Yeah. Because now he said to you, "Oh, there's going to be a great life for you after this, provided you don't screw up." Yeah. Well, not not in those terms, but yes. Yeah. And you have to like think about it. Do I really want to do this? Do I want to continue? Where's this going to go? I mean, is it is it? Okay, just... I want to ask you if this thought popped into your head. <laughs> is this guy a bankable enough movie star for me to uh, attach my hip to his? You know what I mean? Is yeah. he going to get lots of work after? Am I going to do all right? Or is he going to be a guy who flames out after two more pictures? Because that would be the first thing I'd be thinking. I'm yeah. sorry, but I'd be thinking of me. I, I actually wasn't thinking so much of me. I was just thinking of paying the rent. Uh, on okay. my, and I thought if if the worst case scenario is I do one or two other films, which was going to be in New York and in LA, the worst case scenario is I, I learned about filmmaking from my perspective, from being a stand-in. Because you're usually, on the set more than he is. I'm, well, I'm on the set as much as a crew member is. So yeah. you're on the set with, with the camera guys from the beginning to the end. You don't take that day off. You, you're not wrapped when he's wrapped. You're still on because you could be doing photo doubling or off-camera dialogue. So you learn about filmmaking without going to school. So it actually was like a tutorial. You're but being you're paid, paid and learning the job. So I thought if I can do one or two more films, if nothing happens, I already thought that he was going to succeed because he was a Coppola. So I thought he could succeed, things could get really good, or you take a couple of more films, you learn about this, and then you drop out and you start a new life. Right. And that's all I... I, I or, or you shave your head and, and suck up to Bruce Willis. Yeah. <laughs> that's another thing. Uh, and that would have been a bad guy to hit yourself to. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But In that wasn't. End. But Cage was actually very uh, approachable once we started to work together, and he was actually quite giving. And he was genuinely pleased that I went to New York to do the next film. He was just 
relieved that I actually had the nerve to say, hey, I'm here and I'm going to pay my dues and let's see where this goes. Yeah. Uh, I was surprised that he was But it's not, he's never going to pay you, right, Marco? He's never going to pay you. It's no. always going to be the studio. Always a studio. He might write you into his contract. That's correct. So would he determine how much you were going to get? Would he tell the studio how much you were going to get paid and if you were going to get residuals? Uh, no. I, I kind of like uh, jumped the gun on that as well. That was a few films later on I started to Okay, well, we'll for. talk about that. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So basically but, what he's telling you is, yeah, you're going to be my stand-in. The pay will come from the studio or whoever the filmmaker is. Yeah. And you'll just come with me and you'll be my stand-in for as long as it works out for both of us. Yes, providing that you can, at this point, support yourself. Because I was supporting myself going to New York and L.A. They weren't paying for anything. They didn't pay to, for you to go? Nothing. I paid my way the entire time. I put up myself up in an apartment in New York City, if you can believe it, in 1994. And then I, well, I stayed with You mean you had LA. to pay your own rent? They wouldn't even put you up in a hotel Nothing. while he was shooting there? I was getting 12 bucks an hour in New York City Where's on his, a voucher. By the time, for, for the uh, per, per diem. Day. I saw per bucks. hour, uh, not per diem. There was no per diem. I was there. I was hired as a local. The studios wouldn't hire me unless I came in as a local. I had a green card, so it was okay. Um, but uh, they didn't even want to hire me because I was not a New York resident. But Cage vouched for me and pushed it, and that's the only reason they hired me, but they wouldn't give me any more money. And he didn't have the clout to actually lift my salary at not that Not at time. that point. No, because he was second in, second in demand on Kiss of Death. David Caruso was the top banana at that point. Yeah. He was like a part-time <laughs> actor in this thing. So, and that completely flipped. You know who could be uh, <laughs> David Caruso standing? No. Benedict Cumberback. <laughs> Not or uh, or what's his name? The guy from Billions, who I can't stand, the red-haired actor. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The, the British guy, Damian Lewis. Something? Yeah. Damian Lewis could have could have been uh, his standard. He could have yeah. back then, but now Caruso's yeah. not not looking so hot. Well, no, I mean he made Jade, and yeah. then he made Kiss of Death. Yeah, and Cage kind of stole Kiss of Death out from under him. Yeah. Is this the movie you were doing in New York, Kiss yeah. of Death? Yeah, but you, you know, yeah, because he was second banana and not the big Cahoon at that time. Right, he didn't have that clout, but he did second have banana to David Caruso. If you can believe it, you he know was what? Number two in the culture today in 2019. Yeah, he would be second banana to David Caruso. <laughs> That's <laughs> things have kind of gone back <laughs> 25 years later. Yeah, yeah, that is funny. Yeah, it but is second true. banana to David Caruso. That's unbelievable. The guy who went crawling back to TV, CSI Miami, because yeah. his movie career didn't work out. Yeah, uh, he was a well. From what I saw, he was a little on the difficult side to be, a, you know, in a film set. Cage was. You amazing. saw it? Oh, I saw it. Did yeah, you really? I was a part of it. Yeah, the whole time. So I was amazed at all. Did this he shit treat Cage like down. shit? He didn't treat Cage like shit. I think he treated himself like shit. Really? Yeah. All right, because because uh, he played a uh, a tough guy. He, he played yeah, a it. tough cop in a yeah. movie with Robert De Niro, which I can't remember the name of. Shit, I wish I knew it. But uh, it was uh, with Uma Thurman. And Caruso played this really tough cop. And I remember people laughing in the movie theater. We were laughing. Yeah. Because you just couldn't buy the guy. He was a pale beanpole. Yeah. <laughs> with a red mop on top. And, and you just went, there's no way this guy's beating up this 280-pound guy. You couldn't, you couldn't suspend your sense of reality for a minute when this guy was on the screen. I think that was the biggest problem with David mm -hmm. Caruso. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and and not likable on screen. Yeah, not likable on screen. Which is amazing to me when you're likable on TV and yeah. it doesn't translate to the big screen. Yeah. You know? And vice versa. When you're likable on the big screen, it doesn't transfer to the little one. Yeah. I'm but not sure if he was that likable overall, generally speaking. You know, was he, a, on was he a diva? He was not so much of a diva. I, I don't think it was as prepared as he thought he should he should have been on, yeah. on set. That's one thing about Cage, right? He prepares for every single. He's role. beyond prepared. It's sickening. It's like a, yeah. you, I had to come to bat just to make sure, like you like to the point where if he ever plays a serial killer, we should all stay in our houses until yeah, the movie's over. Yeah, that's the way he's I think like, of him. He's he's overly prepared. He yeah. knows his marks, his lines. Like he doesn't miss anything, and it's like whoa and and it really upped my game because i didn't know how a film set worked and i realized i'm just i'm now in with the biggies because this guy didn't miss a beat and right. i had to not miss a beat or i'd be gone grew up around it well, he grew up blood. around it i certainly didn't grow up around it no but, but I he grew up felt around his it. energy yeah it was a he had that coppola dynasty energy about him yet he's never made a movie with his uncle he did though he oh, did what uh, did he do what was the way back at the beginning uh, not cotton club 
Uh, oh, he wasn't cut. Rumble club, fish, you know, what's it, what, Oh, the, the outsiders. The outsiders. He did the outsiders with yeah, him. Yeah, right. I mean, smaller yeah. parts, but you know, young yeah. teenager. Yeah. You know, it was kind of valley coming. girls that made him, right? Yeah, that's when everybody knew who he was. Kind of like a heartthrob back then with that yeah. hairdo. Yeah, which I never yeah. got. I never saw him that way. I know? did back then, but then after that, I I now see him more as a leading character actor. Yeah, yeah. That's how I now see at him. some point you're going to become friends. Uh, maybe. No, I mean, they, during this whole story oh, here, the at some yeah, point, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, you're going to start hanging yeah, together yeah, yeah. outside the oh, set. We did, yeah. And he, so you remember every film you did. Kiss of Death yeah. was the next one. Yeah. That was the first time you were full-time standing. Yes. By the way, tell people how backbreaking it is, because I don't think people know. It is backbreaking, because you're, you're actually a crew member without being a crew member. Right. You, 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 you think you're this actor. You're basically a failed actor. For the most part, you're, you're not an actor anymore, and now you're actually a crew member, but you're now... But you're paid in the cast department, and the you're you're part of the acting team, but you're actually a crew member, and right. it's it's twelve to fourteen hours a day, no matter how you look at it, whatever the crew. So if there's on. a weather scene, like in Family Man, yeah, he doesn't stand in that no wind machine or that rain for four hours. That's, That's you standing in that in in wardrobe, not in raincoats, but in wardrobe, right? And that wardrobe is so it might a wind now. machine, uh, rain, and it might not it might just be a suit and tie. And yeah. you're soaked. And I was. Like in The Weatherman, I was freezing to death. The guy wore, the character wore a trench coat, and it's minus 17 in Chicago. Yeah. And I was dying the entire time. I had pneumonia. I had blue fingers at that wouldn't point. Wouldn't you think they'd give you a heated vest or something or hook no, you up to something? No, because you had to be the same body size. So I wore thermals top to bottom, but you had to wear what he wore for color reasons. And because then I would expand in body mass. This guy was a thin person. I was a little bigger than he was. Right. And uh, and he's broad. So I had to wear padded shoulders. Like He's got this V-shape. I don't have a V-shape. Yeah. So I had to assimilate that V-shape through wardrobe. But if I wore all my bunk, bulky clothes like I have today, then you basically have this 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 big dude who's now not fitting the camera lens. So what's an average day for you on a set? Uh, minimum 12 hours. Anywhere between 12 and 14 hours plus travel time. Right. Now, okay, so you're getting paid by the hour at this point, but are you getting any benefits? No. So what if he gets sick because of the job? Which is he gets quite sick likely. Or me. You. Oh, I always got sick. I, I was sick for 10 years. I was on flu medicine, antibiotics for 10 years, in and out of hospitals in every single city I went to. I was always, because I wasn't mentally and physically prepared, Mike. I didn't know that this job was as hard as it was. I right. wasn't this guy. I was like a waiter who was inside working a six-hour shift. Yeah. Now I'm doubling my shifts, and now I'm outside in the snow. Right. So I was sick all the time, but I never called in sick because he was sick. He was always sick, sinus infection, the freezing cold, and I and he never called in sick and never. But he wasn't being a prima donna because no, you said he was never always complained. Really I looked at him; he's like blowing his nose, they're ready to shoot. They were cleaning him up. He's like, and then he jumps into the seat. I'm like, if he doesn't call in sick, yeah, how am I gonna call in sick? Yeah, like what kind of a leafy fucker am I? Yeah, so yeah. I didn't call in sick. I just kept blowing my nose. So regardless of what he's doing, if it's not a scene that requires him to speak or anything like that, you're there. I'm there all the time. Yeah. I'm, even if he's not there, Okay, I'm what there. if he's got to show his ass? Is it your ass? No. <laughs> so how does that work? No. Your ass no. isn't good. Your body's good enough. To, you're, you're good enough to be him fully dressed. Yeah. But you're not good enough to be him with no clothes on. No. So no, like but if, but kind of we did test shots when we were in adaptation. There were a bunch of nude shots that we had to do with me uh, in those in those scenes, and and the cinematographer took those Polaroids to show Nick the scenes that we had to shoot. So if he's if doing he a okay. sex scene, I don't do that sex scene. I do. But, it who, with, but is he doing it? He's actually doing it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, he doesn't yeah. give up. He'll give up the wind machine in the rain. Yeah. <laughs> but he doesn't give up the uh, sex scene. No, because you go from the face to the body to the body to the face yeah. in the camera, and we also actually when they do nude scenes, by the way, they cover their privates, right? They do always, a hundred percent of the yeah. time, and yeah. and there's always a, a dialogue between the actress, the actor, the director, the producer. Everybody's in a very consensual state of mind before they shoot. So there's a serious comfort zone. It's, it, it's you know, we're not doing porn. These are real f feature films. Right. And no one's allowed on set, including us. Yeah. So everybody's off the set. Especially actors. I, I imagine actors get pretty concerned about nude scenes. Yeah. You know who, who gets concerned about nude scenes in the opposite way? Kate Winslet. I think her agent writes in there that she's got to show her breasts in every single movie. <laughs> I have never seen a movie where she doesn't, I mean, she even played a Nazi war criminal in The Reader and showed her breasts. <laughs> it was more like Ilsa, She-Wolf of the SS, than it was the reader, which I also read.
Uh, but it, it's amazing to me that in her case, she insists on being naked, right wow. all the way back to Titanic. Maybe that's a British thing. I think Helen yeah. Mirren's kind of like if I was a guy, same, same thing. If I was a guy, yeah, there's no way I'd be showing my privates. Yeah, I don't care how big the screen is. Yeah, it's not uh, small. You know, it's, it's going to look small. Yeah, there's no way, no way I, in the world I'd do it. I'm the same way, but none of these guys do. Like, what's like, his name know. in Shame? Uh, the British actor. When he, uh, Steve McQueen's shame, when he had to show, and you, they shot him from the back, oh, and you yeah, could yeah, see yeah. the tip of his dick just yeah, hanging yeah, down yeah. between he's British. his thighs. These guys are just like, these guys, their exhibition is to begin well, with. Well, they weigh 90 pounds, too, so, yeah, so of that they, 90 pounds, 65 pounds is uh, dead. Is, is schlong. Yeah, so yeah, you yeah. wouldn't mind in that case. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but Caged wouldn't do his own nude scenes. No, he did his own nude scenes, but you know, you're covered up in the right thing. But right. every shot you've seen... If he's, for example, City of Angels, there was a lovemaking scene with Meg Ryan. Yeah, they did their nude scenes. This was in Lake Tahoe, and it was in a in a in a cottage, uh, and we all sat outside. Everybody's on, you know, on the, the lawn outside by the lake, and they shot this privately with what they call as a closed set. So right. it's only the essentials: the camera operator, cinematographer, maybe a producer, the stars, and the director. And they're walked through it quietly and and gingerly. None of us are allowed to be there. Not even hair and makeup or nobody yeah. they're not concerned with hair makeup wardrobe they're concerned with the actors feeling the comfort zone and making it look real okay so would you get to have a when they need to stand in for the uh some shot for the sex scene would you get to do a uh, bed scene with meg ryan stand in uh we i did so i mean but you're not naked you know you're no you're, but you got you but like you would these, have to do that yeah, part you're too a neutral color um <laughs> like there was the shower scene for nick when he was in city of angels and i had like neutral color coloring like a t-shirt that was like skin color that kind yeah. of stuff but i wasn't you know i'm a hairy person as well so it really doesn't show well on camera you know especially yeah. when he's not supposed to be so hairy okay so i mean i so i'm wearing a skin colored because all they want is the tone they want a color of a tone and the height right so even in the shower if it's a close-up which we had shot in lake tahoe in this particular shower thing i wore shoes with lifts to make sure that the the headshot version with skin tone color would be the same size so they don't have to adjust right when did you realize this was going to go on and on that you were going to continue with Fuck. it for quite a while I, well on face off that's when i finally well it was promised to me on the rock then it was re-promised to me on con air and things kept getting debacled between the uh the his personal production people and the studios and uh that i was going to be quitting because i thought listen i'm working really hard and i knew i was pretty much the best guy in hollywood at this time yeah but there was a lot of i think there was you know some some jealousy some animosity i think that standards thought, don't have agents right no so i had nick's agent and manager come to bat so it was brillstein and gray and caa that's that pretty powerful came man it didn't get bigger and better than that but i also didn't realize the scope of it uh mike that yeah. these guys actually came to bat and the one who came to bat to initiate that was cage so if he, he wanted you to get more, I asked, he says, you're not getting, he thought I was on a contract though. Okay. He didn't know. Like he's not a financial well, guy. He might not know that. And Anybody, no, any no, normal guy He had guy no might idea because he thought that it was all going to happen. He was told that I'm getting on a contract and he was all happy about it because he's getting a lot of money. The studios had the money to pay me, but there was a lot of red tape between yeah. studios and, you know. Which was film gonna, was your first big payday? Uh, uh, face Off. So that was with Travolta? Yeah. So how much did you big. how much did you get for face off? A lot. Oh, come on, you gotta I, I tell mean, me a number. Well, it's you have to You got more than fifteen hundred a week. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot more. And then there's overtime and double time and meal penalty time and all kinds of stuff. And then your hotels. But at this perks. point the studio's still paying, yeah. Yeah, the but now you're under contract. Paid, but now you're under contract. Yeah. And thanks to, first of all, I'm going to say Cage. Secondly, John Wu, the director, who also came to bat and went to the studios. Okay, you got to tell me about this guy. Yeah, because... and thirdly, the first AD, Arthur Anderson, who also vouched and signed a letter to say, this is the guy you okay. need on, on set. So you're shooting face off with John Wu. Yeah. Here's my question every time John Wu does a movie. How the hell can any actor understand a word this guy's saying? Well, they don't. Right, so, because he doesn't. It's not that he doesn't speak good English. Yeah, no, he doesn't, he doesn't speak, speak English good. at all. Yeah, but like barely nothing. Yeah. So how does he yeah. know that he's getting the best performance out of somebody? It's a, it's, it's kind of like charades. It's a real visual, and right. I and I, you know, he has his uh, his producers, Terrence Chang, and whatever is not really explained by John Wu correctly, or yeah. or what 
they thought was translated correctly, he stepped in. As well, he had a couple of assistants and so forth. But John Woo was very visual of like, you know, grabbing you by the hand and walking you through something. I kind of got that. I, I really understood immigrant culture because I'm immigrant status yeah. and all my neighbors were always Chinese right to this very day. And so they have that same exact tone of like, right. we don't speak English. We no know nothing. And I understood what they meant. So he and I actually got along very well because he understood that I understood him through sign language almost. Yeah. And, and at that time, uh, Travolta and Cage were at the top of their game. Top. They were both. Travolta had just come off Pulp Fiction, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah he would have been on top of his but game he, and too. He was, the, he was number one on the call sheet and Cage again was number two there. He was behind Travolta? Yeah, he was behind uh, You know, Travolta. at that time, I don't think he should have been behind Travolta. I think Travolta's ego was bigger than Cage's, and I think he had bigger representation. Except I read something about Travolta At once. the time. I read something once about Travolta that I found really fascinating, which was uh, in the mid-'80s when he was really doing well, and he was ta doing an interview, and he said, uh, yeah, I never buy anything new. I never buy a new car. Mm -hmm. I never buy uh, you know, uh, a new house. I never build a house. I always find a house that... Uh, somebody's struggling to get rid of and that's the house i'll buy even if it's in beverly hills talked about buying used rolls royces and he's a pilot so he said I've i would never buy a new plane mm -hmm. and i read that about him and went, holy shit this guy's pretty smart because he he's got smart. all the money in the world yeah and if he wanted to he could buy all this stuff brand new yeah. i don't know if he's still like that but that's the way he was then i hear he's still like that he really is smart i mean you, he looks like vinnie barbarino all the time he he acts like vinnie barbarino you think he is vinnie barbarino yeah. even on set it's a game he plays the guy is fucking brilliant he's really smart years ago i saw travolta coming into the restaurant i was working on sunset plaza and he came in like a beaten up old red volvo because right. he didn't want to be seen he wanted just to like kind of hide in came in for a production meeting in this restaurant i had served him and uh and he came in and valeted this shitty car he wouldn't he's very understated very quiet that's what i thought who had the bigger ego on that set him or cage i think he did more than cage yeah because that was one of cage's over the top performances yeah well, I, I think Off. yeah i i think it's because they were playing each other as well it was uh at the time it was considered the most imaginative thing to come out of hollywood in years it's exactly right I remember that about it. And uh, I just remember when uh, Travolta had Cage's face, he would act like Cage. When Cage had Travolta's face, he would act like Travolta. It was kind of interesting. It was. You know? It was It was quite dynamic to see it, Mike, in real life. Like, in, like right there the entire time. Yeah, yeah. Five months. Now, would shooting. they be friendly? Would they get along? They got along on set. I don't know what happened off set, but they right. got along on set uh, to the best of my knowledge uh, from what I saw. Because they both seem kind of methody to me, you know? They yeah. both seem like they'd both be so into their character that they, were. they wouldn't want to deal with each other. Yeah, they, they dealt with each other when they had to deal with each other, but they were really big on, on, on being on their own, doing their thing. So, yeah. uh, and then they'd show up and, and they would rehearse once and then shoot it. So it's, it's, uh, I don't like to say dogged them cause there's nothing wrong with it, but, uh, did you see any, uh, signs of gayness on the part of Travolta during the shoot? I didn't. Uh, uh I, I thought I would, but the truth is Mike and I saw nothing. Um, I saw his wife there often. Yeah. Uh, he had a huge entourage like we did. So it was like a battle of the entourage. Did you see any, point. were there any Scientology people in the entourage? You know, I didn't see any um at all would you know one if you saw one no other than kirstie Allen. dead eyes regardless of color yeah <laughs> yeah you know what i mean the ones who the ones no, who work on the him. ship i mean you can see his eyes are always just like and he's always like hey nice to meet you how are you you know you always over saw the that top him. over the top but introductions he, over the top like eye popping but his people were not like that they were regular his hair makeup wardrobe people everybody was almost in competition for contracts we were yeah. at that point it was the height of hollywood in in the mid 90s and everybody was See, well the rumor, taken care of but the rumor that dogs him is the same one that dogs cruise which is that he's secretly yeah. gay and that the scientology people keep him in line by saying oh, look we'll let that out yeah and by the way you know what if it came down to uh if it came down to giving them 60 percent of my income or fucking a million guys, I'd fuck a million guys, and I'd let yeah. them tell anybody they want. <laughs> I'm not giving them, I'm not giving them sixty percent of my income. I think Hollywood is such a game, Mike. Um, I'd gone to that Scientology Center uh, to see what it was like myself. Did you really? In the eighties, who yeah. sucked you into that? Uh, this, um, I took an acting class, or I took a, a series of acting classes at Milton Katselis, the former director of Butterflies Are Free from the nineteen sixties. He's now deceased, and he had this 
acting school, which was a Scientology-based acting school in Beverly Hills. That's where I met Patricia Arquette and a bunch of other people. And uh, and one of the women there was a chief Scientologist, and I didn't know, and she brought me in, recruited me to go. I was broke. I was just like some, some guy living in the valley. Yeah. And uh, I went to see what it was like. I kept an open mind on everything. Of course, I thought it was insane. It was just like you saw in the movies, these little tape recorders, lab suit coats. You know, they you can't see anything. They try to um, uh, extort as much information and record it and keep it so they can bribe you. Did they have you on the machine first? Uh, they had you on a machine. And stuff. Yeah. After three, four times of going there, I knew that it was never going to be for me, but I wanted to see how far this would go. This was going to go. So you were going out of curiosity. I went out you of were curiosity. Using them. Yeah, well, they were using me and I was using them, but I was yeah. very clear. I'm not a drunk. I'm not a psycho. I was like on the ball. And I said, okay, these people are bananas. And my dear friend, who I'm not going to mention her name because she married some hotshot producer after that. Um, and I realized that she's on, on you know, these people are, are off the rocker. And Is I she just still in it? Back. She's still Your friend? in it. Yeah. 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 I heard once you get in, it's pretty hard to get out. Yeah. Yeah. They have a lot of information on you. And so it's it kind of runs that way. And Lisa Marie Presley was a Scientologist. You know, she was a born and bred Scientologist. Right. So through her mother. Now was this was she a Scientologist before she married Cage? Oh yeah, she was always that. So she was born that way. Yeah. So that was kind of like somebody would be Catholic. So that was her her lifestyle. And I really believe that that was a part of their breakup. I think that I think a Scientologist has to marry a Scientologist or to bring how the hell them into did he, How the hell did he meet Lisa Marie Presley? I don't know. Uh, I, I really don't know how they met, but they were together for a short time and, and they were on set. She was on set a lot. She had her entourage. He had his entourage. They had her security. They had his security. It was Battle of the Titans in terms of uh, Hollywood royalty. And uh -huh. there was me in the middle of all this, this little greasy Greek from Pape and Danforth, some little peasant from here seeing all this stuff and being right yeah. in the middle of it it was it was surreal and if i i tell you i couldn't be ever be with her i mean every time i look at her i see <laughs> the king elvis. of rock and roll you too. see elvis that's all you see you don't yeah. even see her mother the lips you saw her mother that'd be different because her mother used to be pretty hot but yeah to see her dad in that pouty mouth you just go i can't do this i yeah. just can't do this <laughs> you know i'm not good enough <laughs> that's what i'd be thinking you know and was that his first wife lisa marie no, no, no. This was, uh, uh, who was he? he was married to. Well, he was, no, he married Patricia Arquette was, was prior to that. Yeah. 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 He was married to her for a few years. Yeah. How do you screw that up? Sure. Uh, well, you know, I don't know, but all of a sudden there was no more marriage. Actually, you know who I like more? Her sister, Rosanna. I always thought yeah. Rosanna well, she was, was so like the, sexy. She was the TNA sister. She was, yeah. you know, she was the bimbo hot yeah. chicky thingy. Yeah. And their brother, David, he's. Yeah. Weird David Arquette. He is weird. You know, their father was uh, grandpa in the Hollywood Squares, right? Their grandfather? No. Is that who that was? Charlie, uh, I can't, I don't know. I remember the guy, the grandpa. I do remember his last yeah, name. Yeah, the guy in Hollywood Squares. That was their grandfather, Chuck really? Arquette. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. They come from that artsy fartsy bohemian part of town, which is the Los Velas area of, uh, of, of Hollywood. You know, I kind of get marrying other celebrities, though, because mm -hmm. who else do they see all the time? They're never around. Are they ever around regular people? Did you ever see Nicolas Cage around regular people? Just the just our working stiffs, <laughs> like our entourage. Right. You know, hair, and makeup, wardrobe people are regular people. They're just it's just now a job. this. First of all, name the movies you're in. Tell, tell people what. Oh the my God! Films. All of them. I can't. Well, after after a Kiss of Death, it was uh, Leaving Las Vegas and uh, The Rock and Con Air and Face Off and uh, Snake Eyes and Family Man and. Um, Bringing Out the Dead, and uh, there's Adaptation, National Treasure, Lord Ghost of Rider. War. I didn't do Ghost Rider. That was just before I was gone. I, was I, didn't, I didn't want to do it anyway. I, you know, it was Australian. So I was now, at, at what point do you get a script? Do you get a script when he gets a script? No. He After he says he's going to do it, do you yes. get a script? Once he green lights a project, because at the time it used to go through him, so he was the big... He was the big honcho dude. So once it gr it's greenlit and then we're actually in pre-production and they've already set their dates is when we actually get the scripts. Yeah. So then we read the scripts and, and you know, you make your own judgment. If it's I've always wanted to ask now. somebody this question. You're the first person in that position. Can you tell if a movie's good or bad by reading a script? I mean, I think I can by reading it but yeah. then there's so many other elements and i think that's where a lot of actors also make mistakes because you're not, you're not hearing the music you're not uh you're not seeing the editing yeah 
You're not seeing any of that. It's just in raw form when you get it. Right. I mean, you it's don't finished know product, but still. You don't know who's going to be your co-star. You, and they come and go, and sometimes they drop out. You're not sure right. who the producers are really going to be, even though yeah. they have one or two. There's a variety of people. You're not sure where they're really going to shoot. If they say it's going to be Iowa, it could be Florida. So you, you might know. sign on because of who's directing or because of who you think you're going to co-star yeah. with, then you find out you're not. Yeah, but you're already tied into it. Right, which so, has got to be a now, big letdown. Yeah, because then you don't know who the editors are, and what if the editors suck or they're not not on board? So suddenly you're in a shitty film, and you don't know it, but you're going to do the best that you can in that shitty film that you're in. Yeah. yeah. And when did you start to like them as a person, when you saw bad behavior on the part of other people? Because <laughs> you know what I mean? You see them compared to other people you saw on sets? Like you must have seen Tom Sizemore when he was melting down. Yeah, yeah, that was on Bringing Out the Dead in right. New York City. Right, and he was yeah. in the middle of his meltdown then, I think. Yeah, he was... He was Coke-fueled. Just a nightmare, I thought. You yeah. know, a visual nightmare. Yeah. And uh, I don't think I said more than two words to that guy. He was just, uh, it was just bizarre being around him. It's so weird, because from the outside looking in, I mean, you're not really an outsider, but you are. Yes. You're an outsider with an inside look. Yes. And when you look at these people, and you look at what you're doing, and how much you're getting paid for it, you must say, what the hell is their problem? Yeah. Why the <laughs> hell aren't they happy people? I think because they have too much. I really think that, you know, it's, once you get to that level, and you're making so much money, yes, you're a craftsman, you're an actor, you're a singer, you're a dancer, but now you're making millions of dollars, and people are loving you. And a lot of people can't take that fame. It's, it's a little over the top for them, and, and they just want to do their job. But yeah. now it comes with a lot of shit, and they can't handle all that pressure. There's, there's Does it get to a point stuff. where they're only comfortable around other celebrities? Or is there a lot of jealousy? Because I would think there'd be a lot of jealousy. I think it depends uh, on, on what level or status a certain actor is in terms of celebrity. But I think that they find comfort within themselves if they're on the same level. Yeah. But when it becomes a big star like Cage and then you have, you know, smaller actors, there I think that there is, uh, you know, there's a big difference in, in, you know, how you can communicate with these people. Remember, yeah. we had an entourage of trailers and assistants and people around us. And your average actor had maybe one assistant. Now, at what point did you did you ever get your own trailer? Of course. Okay, I want to know what they're <laughs> yeah. like inside. I've always wanted to know what those are like yeah, inside. Yeah, I had my own car. I had my own hotel. I had trailers. I had Perrier water in the hotels. I, you know, I was, you know, I pulled the J Lo a little bit, you know, on the side, which was not really good. But I just, you know, I, I kind of like took it a little bit, you know, a bit of on the run. So what? Why well, wouldn't you? I mean, I was really good at what I did, and I think I, I kind of, you know, it hit my head a bit, and I think that Cage would agree that that was uh, a part of my downfall. But I, it was a, it was a, uh, it was a wannabe downfall. At a certain point, you're just kind of done. You're tired. But I, you know, I, 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 I like those little perks. What was I, your favorite movie of all the films you did with him? I have to say, as tough as it was, and it was probably one of the toughest films, but not the was Face Off. Really? The reason is John Woo was instrumental in keeping everything light. Because he was actually kind of a comedian in real life yeah. way back in Hong Kong. Yeah. And uh, and everything was had humor and music, like a dance movement and, and fun with him. And even though this was this ludicrous sci-fi action film, it all made sense at the end for yeah. some reason. Cinematically, yeah. it actually worked. What about Con Air? There were a lot of people who were future stars on that. A lot of guys... That, uh, that was a nightmare to work on that. Really? I fucking hated working on that film. Really? I that thought was, Jerry Bruckheimer was a kind oh, of a he's guy. he's great. But, yeah. you know, he's the producer, and I'm there with the crew. And you're in the salt flats of Utah, and you're in, in some shitty town in, in, uh, in Nevada. And, right. And, you know, you're in Vegas, and you're filming day and night. And, and then you're on set doing all those plane shots yeah. on, on the studios, uh, in the studios in Hollywood at the time. So that one was tough. particularly exhausting. That was exhausting, really yeah. exhausting, especially when you're in Utah or in Nevada and it's 107 degrees in the shade. Well, there is no shade. Right. So it was like 117 degrees. And you're and outside. it's so important to keep him comfortable so you're used even more. I was dying. Plus, I stood in for John Cusick on that film because I was pre, pre, pre-diva contract mode. And so I stood in for both because in Utah and in, in Nevada, there were no standards. There was only Marco and nobody else. So I stood in for both those guys. Did you get double pay? No, I just flipped back and forth. I just changed from my wife beater to the white shirt to what okay. Cusack wore. I would just flip back and forth. Okay, so when does they the... they were never really in the same scene. 
What film does the big juicy contract arrive it in? It came on Face Off, which was the very next film. It was supposed to be on Con Air. It didn't happen on Con Air. I mean, I got perked up in hotels and stuff, but I was still on a... So on you got the own. hotels, you pulled a bit of a diva, you got a car. You yeah, got, uh, it kept going up. There was the cars, then it was flights, then it was hotel, then it was limos. He just kept yeah. each film... So did kept, anybody ever take you or him aside and go, hey, listen, this guy's getting too much? Yes. Did they? Yeah. I wondered yeah. if they did. Oh, fuck yeah. Every, every film after that. The producers were down my throat with it. They're like, what the fuck? We're flying you in from Canada. They would look the thing, perk thing, stand in Canada. And they would say, we are not flying a fucking stand in from Canada. Yeah. And this battle went on for every movie after that. Because they were just like, All right, we have a hundred But didn't 000. they know going in that he was going to have you? Well, th no, they, they knew that they had an entourage. But everybody at that time who was a big star had an entourage. But I was the only one coming in from another country. So everybody's either coming from New York. So they or saw LA. Canada, and it might as well have been uh, I, you know, Africa because they exactly go, "What? Right. Where's Canada?" Yeah. So they freaked out. Does he have his green card? Does he have a driver's license? Of course, I have all that. Yeah. But they don't know that, and they're freaked out. Like we have a hundred thousand. So do they treat you like shit the whole time they you're did, on the set? The whole fucking time until I proved them how. I proved to them that I was really worthy. And by yeah. the end of the shoots, I had letters of, 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 of love from Spike Jones, the director of Adaptation, uh, yeah. Ridley Scott from uh, Matchstick Men. There, there were letters after that, and there were constant hugs and kisses like, dude, you were like the guy. And right. we didn't realize, because initially all they see is a contract with this guy who showed up in his hair, and like, here, I'm all here. And they're like, fuck you. You know, you have your trailer. You know, they're like a stand yeah. with a trailer. What? What? What do you mean you're in a hotel? Fucking producer doesn't have a hotel. Yeah. So it became a big deal, but I, I had to prove myself, or I had to prove to them that I was actually really good. Worth the money. Yeah. Um, but, what uh, Of all the directors you saw him work with, who do you think was the best? I think that they were all very different, Mike. It's such a tricky question. Um, in terms of being the best being a best director, being a best person, being a best cover, you know, um, somebody who would converse with the actors. I think everybody had a very unique uh, approach to the actors. And I think every film was so different that everybody's mindset, think about it, we did Leaving Las Vegas with Mike Figgis, him and Nick were constantly talking. It was like a private yeah. conversation the entire time. I heard nothing the entire time that these two guys were, were, were speaking and they were oblivious to the rest of us on set. So they had an intense, and I respected that director for what he had done. Ridley Scott was a little broader and incorporated me in conversations and shots and, yeah. and scenes. And I felt a little more, you know, a part of that film, but, and so did John Woo, but so yeah, I but you know they what? were all Le great. Leaving Las Vegas was basically all him all the time. Yeah. Pretty I, much. Like that I movie was going to live break. or die based on his performance, right? Yeah. Which yeah. was incredible. It Every really time was. you think he's uh, flushed himself down for good, yeah, he comes back with something out of nowhere where you go, holy shit, man, this yeah. guy's really good. This guy's script has thousands of notes. And I don't know how many scripts he has, and I'm not sure how many times he rewrites his notes for his character. He's so in deep, deep, deep with his notes and his character, he never shows up and wings it. It looks like he's winging it on, 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 uh, yeah. on screen. But yeah. this guy does the exact same thing from different angles. Yeah. So everything is so well crafted. And I think if you sit there the way I would, I'd watch him, I'm like, he's doing the same thing from different angles with different lenses. It blew me away because I thought there's no way he's going to remember all these little quirks right. when he was like, you know, in, in, in for the, in the, that liquor store and leaving Las Vegas. He's not going to remember this stuff. He remembered everything. That fucker never forget. So forgot he's not anything. a drug guy or a booze guy. No, he got, he just, the whole thing was just like he's drinking water. But I mean, in his personal it. life, he's not a druggie. He's not a boozer. Now, I've never seen him smoke a cigarette. Till he, he drinks. He's a scotch and wine drinker. And I think yeah. anybody who knows him, including himself, would say that that's full of shit. Well, you he know, if he was a drug drugs. user or an alcoholic, he'd be oh, better yeah, off yeah. financially because he's a shopaholic. Yeah, he's a shopaholic, though. He's a fucking <laughs> shopaholic. Yeah, but he's definitely We'll talk about that in a minute, but it's yeah, insane. Yeah, yeah. It's insane. He likes it, but he likes to buy gifts for everybody, like Elvis. He was very much like Elvis. Yeah. If, if we were all, everybody got gifts all the At time. At what point did you start hanging around with him a little bit socially? Uh, when we were on location, he would invite us out for dinners and drinks. But it, again, it was really difficult to do it. It was only when it was a lighter production day, meaning the dialogue wasn't so heavy. Yeah. Uh, there were a couple of easy shots on on stage, but somewhere in some location, for example, Chicago. But otherwise, if he's in LA, we never saw him. And he always picked up the tab when he took you guys out always. and stuff? 
but he ordered the most expensive and he let us order everything i mean none of us really ordered like crazy stuff we ordered the lower end stuff but because we felt guilty because there's a lot of us uh but he ordered so what would an wines. average dinner be with him i have no idea i really? never saw a tab i'm gonna say a few thousand dollars each time yeah yeah, Easy. yeah. and and yeah. he likes his wines and he likes his scotches so is he really friends with uh who would you call his friends who would uh, he call friends today yeah well he, then today. back then back then it was uh years ago it was jim carrey i mean he was friends with sam rockwell very friendly with him as well um with ribisi when he was working uh uh with him uh on Matchstick Donna, 60 Man was seconds. when he was with rockwell right yeah and they were very friendly on and off the set constantly there was a real fun chemistry that guy's a great actor he was great but there was a lot of fun and ridley scott as serious as he is he was he he knew where the fun should be and right. he just he was very light with it because it was a light film overall yeah. but uh he had his his friends were offbeat characters the crisp and glovers of the world and so forth the funny part to uh well the funny part to me is that as much money as he spends and everything i looked up his net worth yesterday and it's not what i thought it was going to be considering all the movies he's made and i don't know how exact that thing is anyway but he's yeah. had so many houses he went underwater on yeah so many things he bought that turned out to be insanely priced that are worth nothing now and you we're quietly putting your money away and paying your SAG dues and getting your SAG pension. I wouldn't hesitate to say that you're more liquid than he is. I don't know if you're, <laughs> you're not worth as much, but I wouldn't yeah. hesitate to say now that you're more liquid than he is. I don't know if I'm more liquid than he is, but I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm basically, you know, financially retired. I'm, I'm not really looking yeah. for a job. After 10 years I, with him. Yeah, I never looked for another job again. Yeah. Like so I when, was, when did you realize done. it was over? What film made you go, this is it, I'm done? Lord of War. The last film. It was a great film. It's a great film. And again, a very different director and directed very differently. The guy was Australian, Andrew Nichol. Then he had his way of working with Cage, and they were very tight together. One of the best film openings I've ever seen at the opening credits with the bullet being made in the factory, then it gets sold somewhere, then it goes into a gun, then it comes out of the Took gun and goes into a hours to kid. set up. Hours yeah. with all those bullets in, yeah. in, in the shanty towns of, of Cape Town in yeah. South Africa. I was there that, that whole time. Yeah, so that must have been hell on earth shooting there. It was. I, I personally, you know, Cape Town was great when you're not working, but when you were working, it was nowhere I wanted to be. Yeah. So at this point, mm -hmm. you're going, I'm not going to do any more. Yeah, I, it was actually prior to that. It was actually it was on uh, the Weatherman and even National Treasure, which drove me crazy, uh, only because it was it was fun, but it was a, it was five states in five months. Yeah, it was all over the place, and and the weather was like from minus thirty to plus thirty. It was right. it was insane. Right. That exhausted me, and I thought I've I known was, you a long time, man. You're not the kind of guy who likes to be taken out of his comfort zone. No. I can't believe you lasted that long. <laughs> I can't believe I actually did too. And the truth is, Mike, there is a, a, a real financial perk by working on these big films. When yeah. you see a Do you Disney get residuals? Film, I get residuals, yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. And so I mean that helped a lot. And I knew that I was getting money off that stuff as well. And I kind who of Who got you the residuals? Him? Uh I don't know if it was him, but it was it was put into the contract and the producers signed them. Yeah. And I added things in. I don't think he saw the contracts. I think the agents saw the contracts along with the producers and they have to sign for it. They can say no to anything. Right. But they signed off on things. Did they really read them? I'm not really sure. Yeah. Um, so how did, how did you break the news to him that this is it? We're it was dying. actually the opposite. He broke the news to, he decided that he doesn't want the entourage anymore after Lord of War. There's a lot of stuff that kind of happened. Lord of War was a, a breaking point in Africa for a lot of us. Yeah. Prior to that, a couple of the key players in his entourage were dismissed abruptly um, during Weatherman, which was just before Lord of War. There's a lot of things going on you know like a like a regular entourage or like a regular right. office thing you there was there they're a bunch of players and whether you were actually guilty or not you're part of that team and i wasn't a player but i was part of the team and i think at the end of it including his hair and makeup guys of 12 15 years and it all kind of like ended with a phone call from his producer and it just shut down it was a one moment shut now was it done appropriately no but Am I okay with it? Fuck yeah. You I think was, it was never financial. You off. think it was financial? Uh, I think that part of it was financial. I, I think that the entourage got so blown out of proportion that he did assist in funds and taking care of us at the very end. Yeah. Uh, and I think that 
he thought is probably not really worth it. And the truth is, Mike, we're not really that worth it. You know what I mean? Everybody had a big ego at that point. We were all making a lot of money. And uh, and by this time, we're kind of like riding it. We're kind of like, you know, yeah, we're showing up on set. It's fine. It's cool. But uh, we were all tired. And we were all, because we, he never stops working. This fucking guy's a workaholic. He's a Even workaholic. Now. He's got the best work ethic I've ever seen in any actor in 30 years in Hollywood. Yeah. There isn't, I don't care if it's DiCaprio. I don't care if it's Travolta. Nobody. I got news for you, buddy. They don't give you marks for work ethic. Yeah. They only give you marks for points, gross. They don't. They, they don't, don't give a shit about how hard you work. But he has that ethic. And I'll say something. He never declared bankruptcy, contrary to what you may read. He never did. He has a certain ethic. He let the properties go, but he didn't uh, declare bankruptcy. He realized he couldn't right. keep up with those properties because he overdid it. But um, he didn't declare bankruptcy. I don't understand. I, I, okay, I kind of get owning a house and a cottage. I don't <laughs> get owning seven houses all over the world. I just don't get it. You can rent a place off somebody, yeah. and then you lock the door and throw the key under the fake rock. Yeah, <laughs> you know, next to the plastic palm tree, and you're gone. Yeah, and especially these people. I mean, they have a transient life as it is. Why do you yeah. want to be tied down with all this real estate? I think people like novelty, and I think that certain stars like to own and 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 have this like. Uh, there's a certain ego and, and a novelty to owning, you know, um, the robot from, uh, from, uh, lost in space or, or somebody's castle. Cause it, you read a book that you love this castle in Germany and it's, you got to own it or, Sorry, man, you know, people buy me. Elizabeth Taylor's shoes and they're like $3 million because yeah. you love Elizabeth Taylor and they may not be worth 3000. Yeah. So that's I, where they lose me on that. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for number one, you grew up around it all your life. What's the fascination with Hollywood memorabilia? And yeah. number two, you look at it and you go, you know, as soon as a, as soon as a recession hits, the bottom of the market, they, that stuff all hits rock bottom. Yeah, including classic cars, like guys like Jay Leno with two hundred, you know, four hundred classic cars. Yeah, these guys, I always go in when when the bottom when the things bottom out, you're sitting there with stuff that's overpriced and costing you a fortune. Mm -hmm. I know? see that. If it was me, I think I'd lead a simple life. But I think that we're very. That's different. why it's not and me. And again, we, we are not from Hollywood. We're from here, and I think yeah. there's, a, there's a big difference. We grew up in a different humble. You I know, don't think Jim Carrey lives the life that people think he leads. No, I, no, he lives a pretty humble life. Yeah, Carrey does, and, yeah, a lot, and so does Keanu Canadian. Reeves. People like that. Uh, Keanu Reeves doesn't even own a house; he rents a house. You know, an exorbitant really? amount. Yeah, he's he's like he's just into his work. He's into his art, yeah. and that's it. Like he lives and he's dating that. a woman who's two years younger than him and looks eight years older. So yeah. people love him now. Yeah, <laughs> he's yeah. like the. Thanks for coming, movie. buddy. That was great. Oh, good. Thank you, Thanks, Marco Curis. The book is stand in. The movie is stand in. How many festivals have you been in? Well, the the uh, the film is called Uncaged and Stand in Story. It's been in twenty one film festivals and won a few awards so far. Yeah, how many awards have you won? Uh, I think five. I'm not really sure. Where can people watch it now? Uh, nowhere, because it's off the shelf. It's not in film festivals anymore. Okay, um, what what about the book? When's the book coming out? The book could be out in the springtime. And it's called Uncaged to Stand in Story. No, it's going to be called Uncaged after all these years. Good. It's going to be great, man. Yeah. I can't wait. Yeah. All right, buddy, thanks for coming. Thanks. Marco Curis. You're listening to You Too with Mike Bullard on the Possibly Correct Network. The king of spontaneity, former host of Open Mic with Mike Bullard, and the former host on New Talk 1010, legendary comedian Mike Bullard is back. Stay up to date with the latest from Mike and the podcast by following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Minds.com, and Gab or navigate to www.u2mikebollard.com. While you're online, please show your support for the show by leaving a review on your favorite media player. You can check out all of our podcasts by following Possibly Correct on Minds.com.